In this video, we're going to take a look at the use, misuse, and abuse of symbols, and in particular, how that relates to the area of persuasion. Before we get to that specifically, though, let me ask you this. Uh, run a little exercise here. What is this? Not a trick question. Just what is it? What would you say it is? Well, this video is in English, and for the most part, uh, most of us watching this are going to probably automatically go to the English word for this particular creature, right? Which is cat. Not a trick question. Again, it's just a cat, right? So C-A-T, cat. But where does that come from? I mean, that's not the only word for it, right? If we were to look in Spanish, we would see that it's a gato, right? Or if we uh, were in Russian, and I'm going to mispronounce this, but that collection of symbols in Russian is pronounced something like kat, right? And that's what they would call if they, if we were in Russia and they saw an animal like this, they would say kat, right? Uh, but if we went, you know, slightly south of Russia to, to China, we would see that this is the symbol for, for this animal. And I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce how they would pronounce it, but, uh, but that's the symbol, right? But okay, fair enough. This, this video is in English. We're probably all going to speak English. Why don't we just refer to it in English? But, uh, I've decided that, uh, that, you know, I don't want to call it a cat anymore. Let's call it a fork. From now on, this animal shall be henceforth known as a fork, not to be confused with the fork that you use to, to eat, you know, and that has the, the tines and things, but uh, we're going to call it a fork, right? How does that sit with you? You know, probably not well, right? Well, why not? Well, because it's not a fork, right? It's a cat. It's a cat. So, okay, fair enough. Let's go back to cat. But where does this come from? Why do we call it a cat? What does that mean? What special significance does that collection of letters have that it would be representative of this animal? Well, that's just it, right? There's no magical formula that says, you know, this animal has to be called this because of such as that. It's just something we decided a long time ago that this animal, you know, or animals of that type are going to be called cats and it's going to be spelled C-A-T. And, and all of this is really just getting to the idea that communication is symbolic. There's no magic formula, but you know, these are all just symbols that represent an idea. And, and so that's where we're starting at today. The idea that communication is symbolic, that all communication is symbolic. Uh, first of all, we have language, right? That's symbolic. These are made up letters and uh, we just, you know, ours happens to come from the Phoenician alphabet, which is developed by the Phoenicians uh, uh, long ago. And, and so that's the one we use in our culture here in the United States. Uh, but as we've noticed in discussing that cat, other cultures use different uh, languages, right? Do use different alphabets and have entirely different systems of putting these symbols together. So these letters, though, are just symbolic. They're representative of something else, and they draw their shared meaning from just that, the shared meaning. They draw their, their meaning from our shared understanding of what they mean. So language in and of itself is symbolic. It's just representative of, of some other idea, but we have that shared understanding that brings us to that, that sort of central meaning. Language is not the only thing that's symbolic about communication, however. Nonverbal communication is also symbolic. Right. We could take a look at, at some of our facial gestures or, 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 you know, facial expressions or gestures or postures and things like that. And those are representative, but they're symbolic as well. Now, there are some that we now kind of have universal, we draw universal meanings from, but, but in a lot of ways, those change from culture to culture as well. And it's not just our expressions and things like that. We have symbols, other symbols that are representative of, of an idea. They are symbolic as well. They represent an idea uh, and other things represent a specific type of brand or, or product or something like that. And are so specifically identified with that item that they're also uh, have become symbolic of that, of that particular product or that particular idea, that particular service. Right? So um, all of these things though, are again, underscore the idea that communication is symbolic. It's not predestined. It's not, again, not sent down from on high. It's not magical or anything of that sort. It's just is what it is because we decided that's what it would be. It is symbolic. It's representative. But still, those symbols have real power. They have real power. But uh, because communication is symbolic, because it's just kind of we, we determined, we decided at some point this is going to represent this, uh, there's also room for interpretation in there, right? There's differences in the way that we see these symbols and what they represent and how they should be interpreted. So uh, symb symbols then are subjective. 
many, many symbols, if not all symbols, are subjective. They, the, the meaning rests in the person who is interpreting that and, and determining what it means. So as part of this, we need to understand that, that all uh, symbols have both a denotative and a connotative meaning. The denotative meaning is what we would call the dictionary definition of that of that word, right? Or that of or that symbol. What does it mean if we look that up in the dictionary? What would it say? What's the kind of universally identified meaning of that particular symbol, that particular word, that particular uh, that particular um, graphic symbol, that particular expression? Uh, what would it be if we looked it up in the dictionary? That's the denotative meaning, one where we're all kind of singular, we're all on the same page with that, right? Uh, the other type of meaning is the connotative meaning. And really that depends on the person and how they interpret it, it depends on what, how it happens to go through their, their uh, psychological process and their senses and their, their frame of reference. All right, so the connotative meaning can vary from person to person. Uh, and uh, years ago, uh, there was a representation put forth by Ogden and Richards called the semantic triangle that kind of represents this idea of the different meanings that a symbol can have. And so the, the, the semantic triangle is just that it's a, it's a triangle. It says there are three kind of aspects to every symbol. The first is the symbol itself. So if we just took this symbol, H-O-M-E, put it together, it says home, right? That's our shared understanding uh, that those symbols, when they're put together in that order, they are pronounced home and they mean home, and right? And so a home could be, you know, this house, this structure that we have, um, that we live in, four walls and a door and a roof and where you go at the end of the day and where you sleep and so forth. That's a home, right? That's the denotative definition. So we have the symbol. Then we have the denotative definition of that, which would be, you know, this building, the structure that we live in as a home. Uh, but then for other people, home is, you know, home is where the heart is. Home is wherever your family's at. Home is, you know, where we find comfort and where we hang out with the, the people that we love, right? That's home. For some people, that's the connotative meaning though, right? Because that meaning is subjective. That may be true for some people, but for other people, they see the same symbol home and we have the same denotative definition, the structure where we live, right? But for some people, home is not that happy place where, you know, home is where the heart is. This is, you know, home is where mom and dad fight or, or home is where I don't feel accepted or don't feel wanted or loved or whatever. So home can have a different meaning for different people. And that's, that's the connotative meaning of that. So one last example here, if we said baseball, took the, took the symbols, baseball, all these letters constructed in this fashion, pronounced this way, baseball, we would, we would think of both the, uh, the ball itself and the game that people play, right? Nine players in the field, one at bat, three strikes, four balls, three outs per inning, so forth. But then for, for, depending on who you ask, for some people, baseball is going to be this really source of excitement and joy because we love baseball. And maybe that stems from playing baseball as a youngster. Maybe it stems from going to baseball games with your family or doing whatever, for whatever reason, we have all these, you know, internal connections to baseball and other people are going to automatically think, oh, baseball's boring. I hate baseball. I just remember having to go to my siblings games or forced to, it's just, it just takes too long and I don't like to watch it or whatever. We have all these connotative connections, the word baseball as well, right? So whether you like baseball, whether you don't like baseball, the denotative definition is something we could agree on. If we looked it up in the dictionary, whether you like it or don't, baseball is the ball itself and baseball is the game and it has those specific rules. That's the denotative definition. Then connotatively though, we're all on different pages. Every one of us is going to have a slightly different interpretation uh, of that symbol because it's subjective. Okay. Interestingly, uh, Language is, of course, in itself connected to a particular culture and a particular context. It is bound by culture and context um, to, to certain frames. So, for example, you know, if we just take a look at language, uh, the symbols of that language can change. Now, some are going to be stable over time, but others are going to come and go, right? So we have, just for example, some of this pop slang from the 2000s. These are words that were very popular at different times in the 2000s, maybe for 15 minutes, maybe for a little longer than that. But there's stuff now we don't really use. We don't really, we don't really use, um, you know, the term bootylicious anymore, which is incredibly popular for the time that song was out, right? We don't really, uh, you know, talk about, we don't use the term cray anymore. I wish we said awesome sauce more. I really like that one, but, but that one came and went pretty quickly. But so these are just pop slang. They, came, they were bound to that time and that culture. And they were bound by that context. They were appropriate at that time and understood at that time. And now they would be considered, you know, out of fashion and not very, uh, not very popular, not very useful. Again, subjectivity. 
these were popular at the time. Now they've been determined to be not so popular. Right? So this leads us to an interesting discussion too about what's called the Saper-Whorf hypothesis. The Saper-Whorf hypothesis um, has to do with what we call linguistic relativity. The idea that uh, that language you can you can kind of look at a culture and determine what's important to that culture by looking at their language and and what kind of words and how many words they have for something. For example, the the famous example is that the Eskimos have you know however many words for snow. Some people say fifty, some people say a hundred and hundred fifty, whatever. They have a lot of words for for snow that all mean snow, right? And why is that? Why do they have so many words that mean snow? Well, it's because snow is such an important part of their lives, right? They need to be able to differentiate between the different types of snow because it's going to have a real impact on what they're doing and, uh, and, and it's going to have an impact on their day-to-day -day lives, right? And depending on where you live, that may be more or less true. I live in the Midwest, so and, and the, kind of the northern part of the Midwest, so we get a fair amount of snow here. We have several words. We don't have 100 words for snow, I don't think, but we have several. When you listen to the weather forecast, I want to know the difference between, and I need to know the difference between the word snow and the word blizzard, and the word flurry, and the word sleet. Those are all different types of snow that, that are going to have an impact on my day the next day, right? Uh, what kind of driving conditions are we going to have? Am I going to need to plan on not going anywhere tomorrow? Do I need to order, you know, lots of milk and bread and eggs and, and uh, uh, because we're going to be snowed in for several days because of a blizzard? There are different terms, but if you live in the, in the, in the south, in the southern part of the United States, you might not have quite as many words for snow because it doesn't impact you quite the same way, right? So uh, the same is true it, just in a larger context in our culture. For example, how many words do we have for the word, for money that all represent money? I bet you we could come up with a couple dozen just off the top of our head, words that, that all mean essentially money, that represent the idea of money, right? But what about the word love? How many words do we have for the word love? I mean, not really very many, right? We use love kind of universally because I say I, I love my mom, right? Which is nice. I love my mom. I also say, I love Taco Bell, which is true. I do love Taco Bell. Uh, hopefully, I mean, my mom probably hopes that that's not true, uh, you know, the same way, but, uh, but I don't have a different word for loving Taco Bell than I do for loving my mom. I have one word, love. But if I wanted to explain money, I have all kinds of words, right? So what does that tell somebody who's not from our culture about our culture? It gives them an idea of the importance of money, you know, really, for better or for worse, the importance of money, because we have so many words for it. Right, so many ways to describe it, uh, and yet only really one word uh, that that means love. So, anyway, an interesting thought uh, there about uh, the saper whorf hypothesis and understanding linguistic relativity. But, but these are all subjective, and you go to a different culture, money would have fewer definitions, and love would have more, right? More uses, more you might be a variety of words that all mean different kinds of love, right? That would I could differentiate between the love that I have for my mom and love that I have for Taco Bell. So symbols are subjective. They, they are subjective. They don't mean um, the same thing to every person. So we need to keep that in mind when we're trying to persuade and when we're communicating in general, but for our purposes, when we're trying to persuade. So what are some of the effective use of symbols? What are some ways that we can use symbols effectively in our efforts to persuade and to understand persuasion? Well, first of all, we can understand the difference between precision and vagueness. Right? We can use language with the specific amount of precision or vagueness that we need to. And sometimes we look, look at this as what we say, the ladder of abstraction. Right? And, and we need to be uh, very intentional about this, though. If we want somebody to, to have a very specific understanding of what we're talking about, then we should use precise uh, language and precise symbols. If we are trying to be a little more in that gray area, then we can choose words that are a little more vague. You know, But, uh, but we need to understand... Uh, when other people are doing that as well, when they're using precision versus vagueness and what that may imply, what that may mean, and what we need to pursue as a result of that. We can also talk about imagery. Uh, you know, we can use symbols to create this imagery and to, to, to really, again, put a picture in somebody's head and to describe something and to understand something. So if I were looking at, if I were trying to describe this, for example, this scene for an audience, I could just say, you know, it's a, it's a wagon path in the middle of a cornfield. Right? And that would be accurate. But if I want to create some imagery, I really want to put this into their soul. I could say the worn dirt path packed down from decades of faithful service divides row after row of tall corn stalks, each a part of the lifeblood that will fuel the world's food demands. That's a little different, right? We're painting a picture here. We're really pressing this into the audience's soul and, you know, um, 
giving it real life as opposed to just saying, you know, it's a, it's a wagon path in the middle of a cornfield. That's not very exciting, but man, we could really use language and use symbols to, to, uh, and, and even just using this picture as opposed to saying a cornfield, we could use this picture. I mean, it's really kind of beautiful if you, if you're in that kind of thing, right? It really puts you, puts the audience all in the same place that we can use this imagery to persuade. But we also need to be aware that others are going to do that as well. So we need to understand the purpose of imagery in persuasion, uh, identification is one of the things, you know, Kenneth Burke talks a lot about identification. We mentioned Kenneth Burke earlier. Identification means connecting with that audience, using language to find common ground with that audience and find common ground with that person and use that as a persuasive tactic and, uh, and, and you know, inroads for persuasion there as well. Uh, we can talk about branding as an effective use of symbols. Okay, we can get away from language here for a little bit and just talk about symbols. What are some of the brands that you know just based on their logo? Right, just based on their logo, it's iconic, right? So, I mean, there's one of these that is recognizable and the other is not, <clears throat> excuse me, right? One that we know and one that we don't, one that we care for and one that we trust and one that we don't. Same here, one that we know and we care for and we value that brand over some others and one that we don't necessarily, right? And these are you know, just examples of iconic branding symbols that have value behind them, right? So. And we can use these brands and different understandings of what those brands represent to, to persuade effectively. We can use unification. This is sort of connected identification, but we can unify an audience based on symbols. Just not again, not even language, just based on symbols. What about the flag? I mean, the flag unites us all, right? The flag is, is something that we, we feel proudly of and, and is representative of us as a culture. And, and so we know what it means. We know what it represents, this idea. And again, that could change from person to person exactly what it represents or what it means. But, but, uh, but we have this idea of what this flag is and what it means and what it represents. Right? So unification is another effective use of symbols, another way that we can use symbols to persuade. We can also use symbols in, in not so great ways. We can misuse symbols in many ways, and this happens frequently. Right? So when we misuse symbols, we're using it uh, to uh, more manipulate than persuade, but, uh, but, uh, but we need to be aware of these types of things as well. Things like doublespeak. Uh, when we use a term uh, to kind of cover the real meaning of something or to soften something, almost euphemistically soften something, um, so when we see images of tanks and things like that, and we, we, you know, but politicians don't want to say we need these war machines. Uh, so they call them maybe instruments of peace, instruments of peace, right? This is how we keep the peace with other nations is by having these, this type of technology. This is why we need a strong defense. These are instruments of peace. I mean, that's some pretty good doublespeak, right? Because these are, these are machines of war and that doesn't make them any less necessary, right? but when we call them instruments of peace, that's not really an accurate description of what we're getting at here. So we need to be aware of and cautious about using doublespeak. Uh, we also need to watch uh, trigger words and be aware of trigger words, right? Words that will have uh, intensified meaning for specific audiences and for specific people. Right? So, for example, here recently, one of the, you know, the, the QAnon uh, thought process, or I don't know what you want to call it, the Q, I, I would call it the QAnon conspiracy, or, but the QAnon, uh, you know, ideals have, have come to the forefront here in the last few weeks and months, and, and they have some specific trigger words, words that if you talk to somebody who's, who's uh, you know, a believer in that type of thing, that will kind of have a special meaning to them. So when we think about the QAnon, we think about news or words like fake news, socialist, patriot, the storm is one of their big ones. And oddly enough, pizza, because they associate, you know, the pizza gate, the Democrats and Hollywood people are running child sex rings out of pizza parlors. So they have this, you know, kind of pizza is kind of a trigger word when you talk to them. So they have these words though, that when you mention these, they get really fired up. And they have significant meaning to them and people will use that to their advantage too. People will use that. Well, if you're a patriot, then you'll do this. And for QAnon people, that's really important. If you want to support the storm, if you want to bring the storm to the forefront, you know, saying things like that will, will get a specific and, and uh, intensified reaction from people in that world. Uh, hate speech is another uh, misuse of symbols. When, when we use hate speech, um, it's a misuse of symbols. It's, it's, you know, it's just a, t a terrible way to, to uh, gain 
attention and to to uh, to to really divert from your persuasive message, but but really bring attention to something else. So hate speech would be another misuse of symbols, and then appropriation, right? For example, the, the swastika is one of the oldest symbols in the world. It's been used for thousands of years to represent a variety of different ideas, right? The swastika in different forms has different meanings, right? But the only one we really know anymore is this one, right? Because the Nazis kind of appropriated the swastika. That's certainly the most prevalent use of it and uh, and the, the one with the most meaning for, for us uh, in contemporary times is that we, we associate the swastika with... Uh, Nazi Germany, despite the fact that it has a uh, lots of other meanings too. In many cases, I would, I would argue that the, the American flag has been appropriated. Again, if we go back to this kind of the idea of the, the, uh, the, uh, the pro Trump Patriot, so to speak, this kind of movement, the pro Trump movement, uh, following the election in 2020, the, you know, stop the steal and so forth, uh, really appropriated the American flags. You saw these people as they were storming the Capitol, you know, waving the American flag around, appropriating it for their use, saying that we are patriots. This is, you know, this is why we are right because we are patriots. And then you see a guy using the flag to, to, literally beat a police officer during that time they've appropriated and kind of taken over that that flag and given it sort of a different meaning in that sense right so, so that uh, it doesn't necessarily totally diminish it for everybody but but gosh they they really have kind of in some ways tainted the use of that uh, the, of that symbol so what do we do with all this? I mean, first we need to understand that we need to be uh, analyzing these symbols as, as persuaders we need to use them wisely and, and use them uh, ethically. But we also need to be on the lookout for these and be able to analyze different symbols. And there are a variety of ways we can do that. Um, one of the, one of the more kind of famous one is what we call Burke's Pentad. It was developed by Kenneth Burke, who's you know famous, you know, uh, researcher and and scholar in the in the area of of language and persuasion in particular. And so he developed what he called the Pentad, uh, the, uh, the dramatist pentad. Uh, and it just looks like this. Okay. It has five points. That's why it's called a pentad. And so his pentad is made up of these five things. And he says, well, first of all, there's an agent. There's a person or a group who take action in the scene. Whatever you're looking at, whatever you're reading, who's the person or the group that is taking action in that scene? That's the agent. Then the act is whatever they're doing, any motivated or purposeful action that they're taking in that scene. The agency is the tool or method or means that are used to accomplish their ends. What, what is it they're using to, to achieve that purpose? Their purpose then is the reason why they're doing what they're doing. And the scene is where all of this is taking place. So you have these five, five points of the pentad, right? So then we could take a look at, at a, at a, you know, just a, an ad, for example, it's an ad for Claritin. Uh, so you can see what's happening here. So we have an agent, we have a man and his puppy, right? That's who's in the scene. We have the act, <coughs> excuse me, which is them playing outside. The agency is just kind of rolling around in the grass, and that's, that's what they're trying to uh, achieve. The purpose, then, is enjoying time with his dog, and the man's trying to enjoy time with his dog. And the scene is the Parker Field. But if we go back and we look a little deeper here, uh, first, then we can see that the agent, again, is you know the man and his puppy. A cute little puppy, right? They didn't pick that for no reason. It's an adorable puppy. Uh, and so the man and his puppy are the agent. The act, in addition to just playing outside, the act is the freedom to live life. Claritin offers you the freedom to live your life, to, to be outside, to enjoy the, the time with your puppy, right? The agency, not just rolling around the grass, but is that there are no restrictions or, or limits. That's the message you're trying to send here, right? That you are not restricted. When you take Claritin, you are not restricted by being outside and by being around a dog and by being in the grass and so forth. The purpose here is not just enjoying time with your dog, but being uninhibited by allergies. Claritin helps you be uninhibited by allergies. And the scene, more than just being a park or field or wherever they're at, uh, is wherever you want to be. That's the whole point, right? You can live your life. With Claritin, you are not restricted. You don't have those limits. So you can be wherever you want to be. So we dig a little deeper here and, you know, Burke would then go into saying, okay, you have these, what they call ratios between these two things. What about the, you know, between the scene and the agency, what's the connection there and what's the, the divide, what's the balance between those things. And you could do that for all of these, these areas of the pentad comparing two of them at a time and so forth, but really just examining, okay, what's the deeper meaning here? What's the, what's the deeper sense of the act and the agency and so forth, looking at each of these areas and trying to really understand what's happening. 
So Burke's pentad is one way that you can analyze symbols of any kind, words, uh, you know, ads, any kind, any, any symbol whatsoever you could examine through Burke's pentad. You could also take a step back and use what we've talked about in a previous video, things like Aristotle's modes of persuasion, right? Ethos, pathos, and logos. When we hear somebody persuade or when we see some sort of persuasive symbol or, or any kind of symbol at all, we can look at it and say, okay, what's the ethos here? Who is the person providing this? What's the or, or organization providing this? What is their character? Uh, what do I, what is their competence? What do they know about this? What do I know about them? We can look at the pathos. How are they trying to appeal to my emotions? here? In what ways are they doing that? In what ways are they appealing to my logical appeals to my, you know, to my senses, my sensibility in my mind? Uh, how is, how is all of this unfolding? And what does all that mean? Are they doing so ethically? Are they doing so in a way that's appropriate? Are they doing so in a way that's effective for me? But understanding those things is important. So we could look at it through the, the eyes of Aristotle's modes of persuasion. We could also look at it. Another one we talked about is Cicero's principles, right? Cicero, Cicero's principles for persuasion. Uh, first, you know, the invention or discovery of evidence and arguments. Where did these things come from for this person or this group? Where are their arguments coming from? Where did they discover this information? What's the background here? How did they organize this information? Are they doing so effectively? Are they, are they doing so ethically? Are they organizing this information in an appropriate way? What's the stylization, the artistic stylization that they're using here? What, what kind of spin are they putting on it? What uh, are they using memorization? Okay. And, and this is kind of an old fashioned one, but are they using memorization? And then finally, are they, are they delivering it in a skillful way? And is that persuading me more than the facts itself? Am I being persuaded because they seem to be smooth, because they seem to know what they're talking about, because they're wearing a nice suit or, you know, they're well put together. Is that having an, a, you know, a stronger or heavier weight than it should? We could look at all these things and kind of dissect this persuasion and analyze it and, and determine whether or not we're being persuaded in an appropriate way or an inappropriate way, or uh, whether we should follow that persuasion in general. So all of this is to say that we need to remember that persuasion is really about symbols. It comes down to symbols and how effectively people are using them. And we need to be sure that, that when we are persuading, that we're doing so in an ethical way, that we're using symbols effectively and also, also ethically and appropriately. And that when we are encountering persuasion, that we are doing so critically and analyzing those symbols, what does that mean? And uh, what, what's the, what's the deeper meaning here or, or, you know, the sense of why they're doing what they're doing and who's doing this persuading and so forth. There are lots of things we can look at uh, when we encounter persuasion. So we need to be uh, aware of that and be critical receivers as well. If you have questions about any of this information, the use and misuse and analysis of symbols or anything to do with persuasion at all, don't hesitate to email me. I'd love to hear from you from uh, on email and, uh, and communicate with you that way. So uh, feel free to send me any questions to my email. Uh, in the meantime, do be on the lookout for that persuasion and do be aware of your own persuasive acts because they are very, very powerful. We need to uh, be doing so responsibly and, and also be uh, responsible receivers of that persuasion. Okay. So be on the lookout and be a more critical receiver of that persuasion as well as a more appropriate and ethical persuader.